Okay, so I shall begin with a question from Zoom. Uh, so this one says, sometimes I get really relaxed in my meditation and see a wonderful golden light. Just as I'm enjoying the beautiful feeling it brings up, <clears throat> it's as though a little voice in my head says, this won't last, you'll mess this up and lose the feeling. You can't go any deeper. I try to be kind to this voice, but it always ends up in me losing the beautiful bliss of the light. Do you have any suggestions as to how to deal with this? Thank you. So this is usually quite common in the beginning when you start to experience this kind of light and bliss and, and you're not quite used to it. Something inside feels a little bit afraid. And there's also a little bit of clinging because obviously uh, you don't want to mess it up or lose that feeling. And yet what you're noticing is that that feeling comes about precisely because you're really relaxed. So it's kind of difficult at this stage in the meditation to, um, to avoid that voice because it's obviously a conditioned pattern of the mind. And whilst being kind to it is a good attitude to maintain, um, it may keep happening. So one really effective method that can start to have some effect is to remind yourself at the beginning of the meditation to make a kind of determination. Ajahn Brahm calls it programming your mindfulness to remind yourself of this potential hindrance when you start to get into the deeper meditation. So at the beginning of the sit, you say to yourself something like, when I get to the bliss or when I see the light, I will just relax. I won't try to cling. Something like this or whatever words make sense to you. And you say it to yourself at the beginning of the meditation two or three times very clearly. So you say, when I get to that stage, I will let go. I will relax. I will open to the bliss or whatever it is. And you just say this to yourself and then continue to practice. So I would say don't worry about it. It's very common. Ajahn Brahm would also say it's par for the course. It has to happen because these are kind of self-sabotaging little voices that we have and that we carry around usually because of some kind of lack of confidence or something that tells us, you know, we're not good enough, we're not competent enough, we don't know what to do with it. But also that sense of wanting to cling so generally speaking, it's an ongoing practice. We have to work with all these things that come up. So perhaps that's suggestive of not having enough self-confidence or compassion for yourself. So you could work on that as well at other times, you know, when, when your mind is not obviously going into the deep meditation, but just in general from time to time throughout your day, throughout your practice. And over time that may have an effect. So really don't worry about it. It doesn't matter if it lasts, if it doesn't last at least you're starting to see the process and how these deeper states happen. So you're realizing they happen when you are relaxed and letting go, when there is not any clinging in the mind. So, you know, the fact that you've, you're starting to experience this and, and understand the cause and effect process is more important than whether it lasts. So um, take courage from that. Yeah, good luck. Uh, anything from here? And it doesn't have to be about deep meditation or... Yes, Remy. Do you have any advice on how to talk to your parents about wanting children? Ah, <laughs> do I have advice on talking to one's parents about wanting to ordain? <laughs> um, it will be different for everyone. Um, for me personally, I did plant the idea that I wanted to ordain right in the beginning of my practice when I'd probably done one or two retreats. So that was 27 years ago and it was actually 10 years before I ordained. So I did tell them that, you know, this was my path in life and I wanted to, you know, continue with this path and thought about one day becoming a nun. Um, actually, I didn't say becoming a nun, I just said I want to ordain because I didn't see it as becoming something. And I didn't want them to think I was kind of becoming someone different either. Um, so I don't know, maybe I can sit here. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I just popped in the idea from time to time. But what I noticed quite quickly with the practice is that the more I would talk to them about it and try and convince them it was a good thing, the more they would like, there'd be a resistance there. So after a while I stopped doing that and I just um, 
tried to, I guess, show by example that I was living a happier life. And uh, I invited them to, to Asia to visit me there. Um, they started to come to some monasteries from time to time. And for them, I think, once they started seeing other monastics as well as me, they realized, oh yeah, there's all kinds of people, people even that maybe they can relate to and people they feel at ease around, some that they don't. But they started to see that just like in every society, monastics are very um, varied. You know, there are all kinds of people that join the monastic life. And um, generally they were quite friendly as well to my parents in the monasteries. So bit by bit, they got used to the idea. But um, I suppose that was after I ordained actually. So I guess it's a process and they might not be super happy about it in the beginning. But I think over time when parents see that you're happy and that you're safe, that's what my parents always say, that's all they really want to know. Um, then they come to accept it and they realize they're not losing you at all. You know, you're there with them even if you're far away, you're developing more meta toward them. So over time they come to feel slightly proud, I would say. I mean, my parents, before they were, before I did anything like a project, which was concrete in the world, they would say things like, um, can't you get a certificate for all the meditation you've been doing? Can't you get some kind of like something to show? And of course that wasn't going to happen. But um, now that they understand kind of how what I'm doing can also be of service in the world, they, they start to feel quite proud in a way. So yeah, sometimes you have to take those steps with courage and uh, later on they catch up, so to speak. So good luck. Yeah. <laughs> nice question. Anything else? Yeah. Sharing for today. Sure. Um, just feeling very emotional. This morning uh, I lost my bunch of house key when I'm coming oh. here. And uh, so my daughter said, Don't worry, I'll drop you. It must be somewhere. Yeah. Home. But whole day, whenever I'm doing meditation, it's bothering me. Yeah. So and I just think that I've just wasted my time. It's such a good place, such a positive no. energy. Teacher is so good, but I'm just wasting my time. Yeah. I'm just struggling so much. Yeah. So I'm just sharing this. Thank you. That takes so much courage to share. So do you mind if I share a little bit with the people on Zoom? Because I'm sure they'll also feel compassion and make you feel very welcome just as you are. So this lady lost her keys this morning and has been worrying about it most of the day, which is quite understandable and feeling a little bit like, oh, am I wasting the opportunity? Am I not doing really well? You know, have, it's such a nice atmosphere and I'm just worried all day. So yeah, everybody's looking so sympathetic <laughs> for you because, you know, these are just thoughts in the mind that kind of try and put us down. And there's actually no reality to that, you know. You're doing absolutely brilliantly by being here and by sitting with these difficult feelings. And it's just par for the course, you know. Things will arise due to this reason or that reason. If it's not the keys, it's something else. And this is just part of life, you know. But as you're feeling and obviously uh, feeling safe and feeling able to speak about it, this is a very warm atmosphere and I think it can be really powerful to go through these uh, difficult feelings and, you know, listen to these difficult voices in our mind, but in a safe space so we can absorb some of the metta. And sometimes on retreats, you know, we can't measure whether it's been successful, whether it's been beneficial by the way we feel during that retreat. It's kind of like an operation. So when you're in the surgery or you're in the hospital, Maybe it hurts a little bit, you know, the wounds have to come open and the pus has to come out. But it's later when you return to your life that you might find that next time something like that happens, you know how to, to be with that anxiety and it, it doesn't shake you in the same way. So I'm, I'm absolutely confident that you will have imbibed a lot of the loving kindness and you will have been practicing throughout the day. Sometimes we only notice the bits that are difficult and we forget the bits where we did let go a little bit. So, so yeah, thank you. I'm sorry that you lost your keys and I hope it all resolves. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. 
Yeah, and like I said before, you know, it's not so much about um, not thinking, it's more about learning to see what our minds do, you know, in these situations, just learning, okay, so uh, worry causes suffering. Worry is an afflictive state of mind. And after a while, when we experience that again and again, we learn to, you know, be able to let it go a little bit sooner next time. So it's okay to experience that. And when you're not worried, you'll notice that, you know, you, you do have some peace and happiness in your mind. So much of this is just learning how we tick. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. It's very nice to have you here too, so you haven't wasted your time on behalf of everyone else because we're all happy that you're here. <laughs> okay, I will read through. I've seen some nice comments, but um, I'm reading them and taking them in, but I'm going to scroll through the, the very nice comments and go to the questions for the sake of time. Thank you. <laughs> uh okay when i started meditating 10 years ago it was quite easy for me to reach that luminous state you were talking about but then when i started listening to teachings on focusing on the breath i forced myself so much to focus on it that it sometimes seemed to prevent me from reaching the state i used to reach in a more unconscious mode in which i forgot i had a body don't know what is best or if I should apply this programming you mentioned too. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, where's it gone? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think you've already diagnosed the issue here, right? Which is that you're now focusing very much and that in a way is squashing, <laughs> squashing the peace and squashing the happiness out of your mind and making your mind kind of contract in this small and narrow way, perhaps with the intention to get something or gain something or to reach something you had before. So really, I would say just start from where you are totally forget about this state or that state it's really not important um, of course if you remember the causes that led to it that can be helpful but you remember them only to guide your practice not to achieve a certain state so at that time it seemed to me that it was quite natural for you it was quite easy to let go and not to focus so maybe just try that again try some letting be meditation and just uh you know, see how you're relating to the practice. Are you kind of trying to hone in on something and hold it with force or are you trying to let go and, and just be at peace? Um, again, it doesn't really matter which state you reach or don't reach. It's all about understanding the causes for freedom from suffering. So you could apply some programming if you want to. You can uh, try that out, but be careful what it's about. Don't make it about a goal, make it about the causes. So you're trying to uh, program your mind to put the causes in place. So you might say something like, may I be gentle with my mind? May I um, avoid focusing or striving in the practice? Something like that. May I enjoy this moment just as it is? You know, you could, you could add those kind of things perhaps. Because it's only ever about where you are now. It's not about getting somewhere later. I'll just go to this one more question here because it's related to ordaining again. And someone's asking, is there a sort of thing like a calling to ordain? How did we decide if we have to serve our parents first or go for ordination? So, yes, I would say there's definitely a calling. Um, but you have to be careful that it's not a running away from anything. So sometimes what people think of as a calling is actually a kind of almost like a desperate urge to get away from something. And this is not the right, uh, the right kind of motivation to ordain. But if that calling is coming because it's something that just feels right for you, it feels like an outcome of the practice. It feels like it, uh, there's nothing much that pulls you in the world and that you want to really devote your life to the Dhamma, then yeah, I would say stay with it for a while and don't rush the process. And uh, if you're not sure yet about whether to serve the parents first or ordain, then it's not the right time. So whenever you're not yet sure, don't, <laughs> is one of my mottos. <laughs> 
right? Wait until that clarity of mind comes about and, you know, try serving your parents and talk to your parents about this. Let it be there in the background and, and see if that calling grows. And at some point, you know, when it becomes the only thing that you really want to do, you'll know it. And then, even then, it'll be a matter of the causes and conditions falling in place. So it's a very, very unique and kind of specific path that doesn't suit most people and is not necessary or not a part of most people's path maybe in this life. Um, but of course, as a, as a bhikkhuni, I will say it's a very powerful path and it's a great source of both challenge quite often, uh, more in terms of finding conducive conditions as a non to practice in because there's a massive imbalance in things like resources, support, teaching, access, etc, etc, places to actually ordain. But it's also an incredible joy if you do feel that you're following your life's path, you've found your meaning in life and uh, that gives great strength to, to persevere and continue on. So yeah, don't rush anything. And just keep exploring that question for yourself. It's different for everybody. Yeah. Anything from the floor? Any potential nuns here? <laughs> oh, this fellow. <laughs> okay. Sorry? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean between the mind and the illusion of self. Do you mean that you're starting to see that the mind is different from the self or that the mind is also non-self? Yeah, so this, this person saying that um, he's starting to see that the mind is different from what you would normally conceive to be a self, I guess, yeah? That there's something watching the things that you are identifying with as self. Is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah. So, and do I have any comments on that? So I would say that this is a certain stage in the practice, um, which is pretty common for meditators to come to. And it's almost like with all of the practice, we're gradually letting go of clinging. We're gradually letting go of identification to the coarser things first of all so at first when we practice we start to see that the body is not self that's probably the easiest place to start because the body especially when you're in contact with the sensations and um, in a kind of consistent way you realize that they're just changing constantly to such a extent that there's nothing you can actually <laughs> fix to you know it's just coming and going and rising and passing like bubbles and the buddha actually described sensations or vedana feelings like um, bubbles or like raindrops plopping on a lake and all the little um, bubbles that come or like mustard seeds in a frying pan. So we start to see that this can't be self because it's constantly kind of disappearing basically. And then after a while, especially with something like breath meditation, we might start to enter the realm of the mind much more and the mind and the mindfulness become very strong and uh, the sense of the mind can almost overpower the other five senses, you know, so the body starts to fade and the other five senses seem kind of a little bit remote. Um, and then we start to feel like, okay, this mind is who I am. But actually, even that is still an illusion to some extent. I mean, of course, we identify more with that because it's kind of how we think and perceive and, um, you know, it seems to be always there. But the Buddha said that even the mind is impermanent and non-self. So it's okay not to see that straight away because that's, that would actually be a very high stage on the path. That's the kind of stuff of stream entry when you realize the whole thing is impermanent and can pass away. So I think it's a gradual kind of piercing through this illusion of self. But um, yeah, at least when we start to see that the mind is kind of producing so much of this stuff that we identify with and you know that our mind has the power to influence our world and even create our reality then at least we're working at a deeper level we can work um, directly with the mind so I don't know if that makes some sense yeah great ah so 
I will come to another question from Zoom. Uh, yesterday, when talking about the four aspects of mindfulness, yeah, that's the four uh, focuses of mindfulness, you mentioned that emotions fall under the section of Vedana. Would you say thoughts are as well part of Vedana or part of mental contents? Could you please talk about the difference between the second and the fourth Satipatthana? So between the Vedana and the um, content, the Dhamma, uh, Dhamma Nupasana, uh, the mental contents. So yeah, this is a massive subject and it's probably not possible to give a deep answer to this, but um, I would say that uh, when I said that uh, mental feelings can fall under Vedana, I was m not necessarily talking about emotions, but I was talking more about um, the experience of happiness or pleasure, the experience of um, pain or unhappiness and sort of neutral experiences. And they can be of both body and mind. Yeah, so there can be mental feelings and also physical feelings. So in that sense, they come under Vedana, like the pleasant, uh, painful or neutral aspect of experience comes under Vedana. Um, the thoughts themselves probably do fall more into the fourth Satipatthana um, because they're contents of the mind, but thoughts as well are connected with feelings. So the two can't really be separated because whenever you have a thought in the mind, it will have a certain um, resonance in the body. And so by observing the body and the feelings in the body um, and the pleasure or pain, if you like, you will also get to sense the nature of a thought, like whether that thought is a wholesome thought, like a, a thought of loving kindness will tend to evoke pleasant feelings in the body, not only in the mind, you might get like warmth or tingling and unpleasant thoughts will probably create maybe anger and you might experience that as kind of heat in the body or maybe even pain in the heart, you know, stress can cause like tension around the heart area or anxiety in the tummy. So they're not entirely separate. Um, the main thing that's important here is that we understand all of it is impermanent and not self and that we learn to relate to these things wisely um, and understand that this is just feeling, this is just mental content, it's not me, it's not mine, it's not a self. Um, so whichever one it, it seems to fit most into, they all overlap. Um, and they all, like if you would take one of the Satipatthanas to work with uh, as a predominant meditation for you, they would all end up, you would end up under having insight into all of them. So my teacher in Burma used to describe that as like uh, the Shwedagon Pagoda. I don't know if anybody's been to Myanmar, but there's this incredible, huge golden pagoda, which is about 100 meters high, that sits on the top of the city, like it towers over the city. And there's these four, there's a huge marble kind of walkway around it and many, many Buddha statues. And it's just spectacular and full of people meditating pretty much all day and night. And there's these four huge stairways up to it. And, uh, and my teacher likened those to the four Satipatthanas. You can take the northern stairway, the southern stairway, the eastern or the west. But when you get to the top, everybody mingles and walks around the pagoda and it all comes together. So, yeah, that's a summary <laughs> of what comes to mind for that comment. So, yeah, good that you're asking and see if you can connect everything that arises to some kind of uh, feeling or sensation in the body that can be really helpful to um, to understand the mind. Okay, anything else from here? Yes. I've been thinking about this and I'm going to say it in. So about four, maybe five years ago, I had a major stroke, uh -huh. which meant that I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I barely knew anything. Knew my name and date of birth for some reason. Yeah. And everything else left the building for a time. Wow. When, did, when I was in the hospital the first few days, I heard, dreamt, felt or imagined this. Good morning, Norman. I'm the Buddha. I've just come by to say hello. <laughs> I can't stay because I'm really busy. Bye. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> 
I have to share that with people here. Good. Did anyone hear that? You're, some of you are laughing. You could hear. Okay, so he said that um, he had a stroke about five years ago and uh, couldn't remember anything, basically, except his name. It was like everything left the building <laughs> of body and mind. And, uh, but then he had this dream or, or kind of uh, imagination or something where the Buddha came by and said, Hi, I'm the Buddha. And uh, did he address you? He addressed you by name. <laughs> yeah. Morning, Norman. I can't stay too long. I've just come to say, I've just come to say hi. Is that right? Hi. And then bye. <laughs> Which sounds very nice. Yeah. It's funny that you mention it actually, because yesterday I was talking with my host and we were saying, uh, I was saying that I often dream about um, my teacher Ajahn Brown, but I've never dreamt about the Buddha. Maybe there's something wrong there. As a Buddhist not. <laughs> Maybe it's true, he came to you. He never came to me, so you're very lucky. <laughs> Even if he couldn't stay long. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, if it gives you inspiration and, yeah, and hope and courage, it's great. <laughs> okay. Can I come to anyone else in the room? Because I... Uh, I think you were just... I'll take you both. Okay. You want to go first? Working with anger. Okay. So, um, obviously the loving kindness is very, very helpful. <laughs> and uh, the Buddha also taught... I mean, I would actually recommend the book that I've been using on this retreat. There's a whole section on um, overcoming resentment which is, I guess, the anger that becomes ingrained. And there he talks about different kinds of anger um, and ways to overcome it. And uh, one way he describes the different types is like uh, the anger that's like a line drawn on, well, chiseled into a rock. So it's like you repeat the anger pattern again and again and again until it becomes so deeply entrenched as part of the mind that it's like ingrained in the rock and then there's another kind which is like a, a line through the sand um, which obviously kind of covers over much more quickly and then there's another kind which is like a, a line in the water so it barely affects the surface of the water um, and also he talks about uh, some anger that comes up quickly and is very strong but also disappears quickly and some that comes up slowly and lasts a long time some that's virulent, some that's not so virulent. So all these different kinds and ways that anger manifests. And I think sometimes it's helpful just to hear that, to know that it's normalizing the experience of anger. It's just talking about it as a phenomena that's, that's common for most people to experience. Um, and then he gives in another sort of five ways to overcome uh, resentment, which is again, the loving kindness. But, um, probably not so wise to begin loving kindness with somebody you're angry towards. It's much more advisable to start with somebody who brings a feeling of happiness and who brings a feel, you know, who it's easy basically to develop loving kindness towards. And then if you practice with that person for a long time, you can slowly, slowly spread to other people. So maybe a neutral person who you don't have any particular issues or investment with, invest, vested interests with. And then if you feel that you have metta in mind, sometimes from time to time you could bring up um, a person or even an incident that caused you anger and just bring it to mind with loving kindness in mind. It might impact you and it might be that you can't practice for long, but at least you're um, attempting to work with it. And over time you might find that the anger lessens that way. Um, the other thing is to practice compassion, if that doesn't work, and then equanimity. Uh, the fourth one is to basically try and ignore, if it is a being that you're angry with a person, try and ignore that person for a while. So it means have some distance. It doesn't mean you're kind of necessarily cutting them out of your life for good, but it means have some distance, and that can be mental distance as well. Um, and then lastly, to reflect on the law of karma that if somebody's done something that's hurt you it's their business and they're going to have to um, deal with the result you know and you can't um, be responsible for that person you can't fix that person all you can do is be responsible for yourself um, and then there's one more really nice sutta 
which says that if a person, you know, if you have resentment to a person, you can try to focus on their positive qualities as a way to um, slightly um, bring some more balance to your perception and to your perspective because everybody has good qualities as well. Um, so to try that from time to time. Um, one of the things he says is that sometimes a person's speech can be very impure but their bodily conduct can be quite good or it could be the opposite. And I remembered uh, a person just like that in my life who was a care worker and she had really coarse language, you know, effing and blinding throughout the shift. But her action towards the people she was serving was really kind. She would go out of her way, you know. So even though she was effing and blinding, she was there the moment the, um, the people in the nursing home needed her. Um, so sometimes we can do that as well. So, but be kind to yourself if you are experiencing anger because it's quite an afflictive emotion. It's a lot of suffering there for you. So I would say a lot of self-compassion as well for yourself when you're having that emotion. Yeah, just to be caring with it and, you know, accept that it's, <coughs> it's a natural thing. Yeah, okay. Uh, 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 uh. So someone's asking about schools of psychotherapy, but I can't really comment on that. I mean, I'm not a psychotherapist and I think this is a sort of fine line um, between, you know, different ways and, and uh, prescribing in a sense or recommending different ways of healing for people as a Buddhist teacher and yet not going beyond my own area of expertise. So I do think, you know, if somebody is suffering from emotional abuse, it's very good to have some psychotherapy if you can. And as far as I understand it, I haven't done very much at all myself, maybe four sessions in my whole life or something like that, or maybe eight, I don't know. So I, I don't have much experience. In my teens, I was quite depressed. I had about two months worth of cognitive therapy to change my thinking patterns to something a bit more positive. And then, yeah, with some trauma, I did have a little bit of uh, psychodynamic counselling, but I'm not sure it was the type that was effective or whether it was that the person was a very, um, a very senior psychotherapist with 40 years worth of Buddhist practice. And she just understood exactly what I was going through. And it was the validation, it was the um, ease of communication with that particular person that was really helpful so it only took a few sessions and that was that was great luckily I was out of the situation as well by then um, so yes psychodynamic might be good but I think you really need to explore that for yourself because it's not my area and I'm not an expert in these things um, but if you do feel if you don't feel at ease with somebody if you're not really sure they're the right fit then keep looking I would say because it seems to me from what I've heard from many people is that getting the right person, the right fit, you know, it's not that one's necessarily better than another, but it's a, it's a relationship that you're having. So you need to feel unjudged. You need to feel safe. Um, you need to feel you can talk really freely and explore whatever's happening for you. So um, good luck. I really wish you well with that. And I think it's very wise to, to seek that support. It's also an act of kindness and compassion to yourself. Anything else? There was a, yeah. Would you like to ask something? Yeah, I was just wondering what the book was that um, you talked about, because the study Sana and stuff, I'm like, mm, I don't really remember. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. I wouldn't mind reading a bit more about About the Satipatthana or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, the book that I'm reading from here, I was, uh, t because it's the only thing I have with me, basically, because um, <laughs> the other ones are really huge. Um, is Social and Communal Harmony by Bhikkhu Bodhi and in there there's lots of stuff on um, personal training, proper speech, um, overcoming resentment as we said and uh, what else was I reading from? Uh, harmony and community basically but it covers a big range but if you want to read um, around the Satipatthana Sutta then you can read directly from Majjhima Nikaya the Satipatthana Sutta there and I think in the Digha Nikaya, there's the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, I think. And then there's also the Samyutta Nikaya, the Satipatthana Samyutta. Um, so that will go through the Satipatthana Sutta. And there are also some really good books by uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Analeo. 
um, who does a massive uh, study of the Satipatthana Sutta. So you could go for that. And uh, I think the whole sutta is in the, uh, what do you call it, in the end part, in the, what do you call it, index or something. Anyway, the bit at the end of the book, but he goes through it in a lot of detail as a practitioner. So that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> There's another question in here about um, Chittanupasana. And I'm kind of a little bit reluctant to go into that in depth because it's going a little bit off course. But in the context of this retreat, really what we're understanding as um, observing a mind is, is the mind freed from the five hindrances and also the mind freed from the five senses in breath meditation. So I kind of agree with my teacher that any other contemplation of mind before you've freed yourself from the five hindrances and the five senses is not going to be that effective because you can't really distinguish between mind and the things that are there kind of uh, alongside the mind, the perceptions, the thoughts, etc. That's not actually mind itself. So um, Chittana Pasana is kind of seeing the, I mean, in a basic level, you can just see the general condition of the mind, like whether the mind is expansive or contracted, whether it's agitated or calm. And that can be helpful at the beginning of a meditation to kind of direct you into a theme that might be helpful. You know, like if it's particularly angry or tight, you might want to try love and kindness. If it's relaxed and spacious, maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to uh, bring a bit more focus or maybe you actually want to just let be. So it can be helpful just to see the condition of the mind and, and work with that. But yeah, keep keep going with uh, removing those five hindrances so you can see that pure gold free from the other defilements. Yeah. And I mean defilements of gold. I don't like the word defilement for <laughs> states of mind. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you so much for the lovely comments. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else in this room? Because, oh, it's already 10 past four. We need to uh, probably close up pretty soon. But anything else from here? Otherwise, perhaps I'll take one last one from the box. Uh, have I any technical help to write the name of that book in the chat box? Because I don't touch it. <laughs> And, uh, and I'll just answer a quick and easy question. Is it okay to practice metta to all beings and not to real persons? I mean, in general, like in the chant, aham, yeah, sukito homi. Um, yes, you can do that. Um, in the Buddhist text, it actually talks about metta in the four directions. It doesn't really talk about metta to different groups of beings. Um, the Buddha's just saying, spread loving kindness to the front, to the side, to the back, above and below, in every direction, so generalized metta. But I think uh, it's from the Visuddhimagga that there's one of the commentaries to the text that it talks about going through the categories of beings in a systematic way. And I think there's a lot of merit to that because otherwise we can bypass people we have issues with and we think we've got boundless metta for all beings, but actually we haven't really um, addressed the resentment that's still there in us, the anger that's still there, maybe there are still grudges that we hold. So I think it's very, very helpful to work with the categories and then from time to time, maybe spread to all directions. That's absolutely fine. So see, you know what works for you. And uh, you can even spread metta to things as well, like your cushion or I was going to say your cat, but that's a being, <laughs> um, your cup. I did that during my long retreat. It's a bit kooky maybe, but um, I don't know. I was in this little contemplation from a, a Christian tradition actually and, and uh, imagining that the cop had like a history and it, uh, it had been through a process to get to me and, and thinking about what the cop was for and yeah, kind of really sensing into it and feeling it and looking at it and feeling gratitude. And it was amazing. It really conditioned the mind in a very gentle and appreciative way. So it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, what the object of our practice is so much as the skillful ways of looking, the skillful perceptions and the wholesome qualities that can be developed in the mind. That's, that's the really important thing. Yeah.
Okay, so I'll just read through this last one because it's not a question, so it's much easier. <laughs> and I do apologize to all those people I couldn't get to this time. We'll just have to do another retreat. Um, but the last one says, I like to share seeing a Buddha in a dream standing next to me, seeing the Buddha. He was tall and had a very strong, very gentle, caring personality that I felt he had. I was feeling completely the opposite at the time. <laughs> we were in a forest area looking at all kinds of trees. My focus falling on a strong tree, something like the Bodhi tree. Then he disappeared. Learning and practicing Dhamma brought me a lot more peace and happy lifestyle to my life. Wonderful. It's so lovely to have those dreams. And when you do, please remember them, bring them up in your mind because they can be very comforting and inspiring. So we didn't do that in this meditation, but in the past I have uh, started the meditations with uh, imagining that you're in the presence of someone like a Buddha or anyone who, you know, uh, is a safe space for you who kind of evokes that sense of safety and peace and, you know, someone who would look at you non-judgmentally. And that's a really lovely way to start the practice. And it helps us to learn to look at ourselves that way as well. So, yeah, bring it up again. Any, any pleasant dreams, because we tend to relive the difficult experiences so many times in our minds. And when we can learn to relive the good ones too, then we encourage our minds. It's not like we're living on cloud something or other it's like we're just encouraging ourselves to go in the right direction so don't be afraid of doing that and thank you for your lovely um <laughs> comments i wonder if we can just save the chat because it's really encouraging for me can we yeah. lovely excellent <laughs> all right so we're going to do a last meditation to finish these wonderful days together um and I think it should be a meta meditation to see if we can spread loving kindness to all beings or if you wish just spread in any direction that you like.